get a more experience, um, how to get the interview experience in the software engineer work. So if you are interested, please contact us. We have uh, several uh, the social media connect later uh, for you to join us. And the next one is leadership lecture. As I mentioned before, this is a very close interaction. We want to have the uh, close relationship with the uh, leader and our volunteers because we really honor the time from the leaders who want to share the experience, their time to help our community, especially the volunteers. So once again, this is, we call it as a leadership lecture. That's the only invite, uh, it's on, invite only. So uh, the last but not least is our technical series presentation like today. Uh, today we have honor to invite the guest speaker, Dr. David Guo. Um, so here is a little bit about uh, uh, Dr. Goh's background. He's a first generation of immigrants. So he really understand, uh, have the same experience and, and to the target uh, audience or target community, a same experience that, um, for the USA life. So uh, he could have a very close understanding how we feel, what kind of uh, life experience we need to get supported. So uh, welcome everybody to have a question to ask David uh, after his presentation. And David himself actually graduated from the UC Berkeley in 1989 with a PhD in um, mechanical engineering. And he also has a long working experience in the uh, hard drive business in Seagate, more than 20 years. Of course, he also holds more than 110 US patents, worldwide patents. And then uh, recently, uh, in a recent couple of years, he decided to change his career in a startup and to try, try to um, leverage his leadership experience, also um, try to start a new uh, his journey in his um, uh, the life career. So join the he already joined the Waha company as a uh, executive VP of engineering since August 2018. And the most important things I want to introduce uh, to um, the audience is that uh, the passion about this leader. So David Ko is the person I know who has the best passion about the leadership development. He has a very good experience about how to grow the team, how to lead the people who has no experience and also grow the leader under his team. And he also devote himself a lot in other um, in the volunteer groups. Um, so he really has a passion about grow the community, also serve in the volunteers uh, organizations. That's why uh, we really have honor to invite Dr. Ko uh, to give his talk today. So last, uh, this is the, the social media connection. If you want to join us, you want to learn more about us, please scan this QR code right now. Uh, please join us, especially the e uh, newsletter so that you have chance to get the email from us uh, to, under to learn the most updated uh, event schedule. So now let me pass to pass the stage to Dr. Guo. Dr. Yeah. Guo, it's your stage. Okay. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Well, I think thanks very much for uh, uh, Wilson's introduction. Uh, a lot of good words. Uh, I don't know whether I worth it, but <laughs> I give my best. <laughs> I try. Actually, uh, according to uh, Wilson's uh, suggestion, uh, he recommend me to focus more on experience sharing and less on technical uh, sharing. Uh, so, but I have to share my slide first before I can share anything. Yes. <laughs> share screen. Yeah, could you put in a projection mode? That's what I'm going to do. Thank you. And so now can you see the slide? Yep, perfect. Okay, well, I, I think today yes. what I'm going to share with you is uh, after 26 years of staying in Seagate and rise up through the rank to uh, serving managers and how I switched to a totally different uh, journey of uh, pursuing a, a different project. Um, so I think this actually there's a lot of interesting things that uh, just for you to think about. 
you might not exactly follow my path. I think you'll create your own path. Uh, but uh, I think through the career and jump through different project area, I think you really learn a lot. Uh, that that's good to share with the community. Uh, let me do a little bit of self introduction. Um, this slide actually has my LinkedIn uh, profile. So if you want to be friend with me on LinkedIn, uh, please do. Uh, so uh, I'll be glad to uh, include you as my friend circle. And personal, uh, uh, my parents actually are from Tainan area, but I grew up in Taipei area. Uh, and my parents come from the countryside. Uh, so I sort of um, enjoy the country uh, side quite a bit. Uh, but after all, I'm, I'm a city boy. Uh, so I have a little bit of, of both. And, and in my career, um, I actually, after I graduated from, uh, from Berkeley, um, my, um, I actually specialize in heat transfer. Uh, but at that time, actually, it's a pretty down time for heat transfer measure. So it's very difficult to find a job if you are in heat transfer measure. So I ended up joining the startup uh, doing optical design uh, for a, a startup company called Everett Flight Touch. And we are doing an interactive large screen design. Uh, so I did literally lead a team uh, to develop that equipment, go to trade show, and uh, do a lot of these uh, interesting experience other than technology. And you have to force yourself to work out of your comfort zone. And instead of stick around to heat transfer, now you have to pick up the book to learn optics, to learn mechanical design, to learn analog design, uh, even try to learn firmware design uh, in order to make that equipment. So it was not to be a pretty good experience for me. Um, but uh, unfortunately, that project uh, did not go anywhere. Uh, our mothership, uh, Everex, is a PC company, uh, lost their battle in, in the, uh, the PC price war. Uh, that's where US moved all the PC industry to Taiwan. Uh, that's, that's a transition. <laughs> so Everex lose out. So I lost my job in Light Touch. Uh, so I, I ended up in Seagate. Um, the, um, and through a, a, a friends of mine uh, in UC Berkeley. And so I've been uh, working through the rank of uh, an engineer uh, and then rise up to the rank to a survey manager. Uh, again, in CK, we, we follow our Moore's law. So it's, it's quite different, um, different Moore's law than, uh, than a semiconductor, but it's equally challenging. And we keep reinventing technology and face out technology that's, that's not useful. Say, for example, my claim to fame in Seagate is I actually developed the laser texture technology to enable MR drive uh, development at that time. So I rise up in rank in Seagate very fast um, because I, I delivered that in two years and I was a junior engineer and I have to lead a team uh, to implement product uh, eventually the, the the production tool into a uh, factory. Uh, so a, a bit of experience of that is kind of fun, um, but then I choose to stay in advanced development uh, for almost 10 years. Um, and then, then the, uh, in 20, is that 20, is it 208? There's a financial crisis. <laughs> the, uh, then, Seagate decided to shrink on the activity. So we got forced to move into product area. And it actually is a pretty tough adjustment for me uh, to move into product area. Um, but, but I have to say, uh, through Seagate, uh, I worked through advanced development on the area and then worked through product qualification, high bottom product area, both experience turned out to be a pretty good ex experience enable my current job. Uh, so I'll say, you know, one video I would highly recommend you guys to watch is the Steve Jobs, uh, 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 the, uh, the, uh, the graduation speech uh, in Stanford. Um, basically three points. Uh, one is follow your heart and then try to connect dots uh, and 
you learn your dots because you really don't know and you have to learn it well uh, because you're interested in that or you think there's a potential to it. When you learn something, you learn, learn it well. Uh, in the future, you will become something as an enabler for you. If you do everything half-heartedly, half then you might not have the chance uh, when, when you require that skill set, then, then things cannot be done. Um, so, and I also have the, the product uh, qualification, uh, knowing what reliability is all about and all this. So actually it turned out to be pretty beneficial to my current job. Um, and one advice I, I'll give everybody is, uh, why you are in your job or you attending any community service or community, uh, get to know a lot of good friends and form your network. I think it's actually important. Um, the, the very reason I got my current job because uh, at that time, the guy hired me used to be my manager in Seagate. Uh, and and of my current company, uh, the when I joined the company, the chairman was my colleague in Seagate. And I seems like I do have the reputation uh, while dealing with them. So later they become my connection and help me to secure the job. So, um, so you never know what would happen, but, uh, but while you are doing your job, do the best you can and build up a good reputation. Uh, so in the future, who knows, somebody might come up with a good position for you, then you have to grab the opportunity and, and just run with it. Right? And uh, I think the other critical things I think for everybody's career is if you have a chance, you can actively participate in community service. Um, it actually broadened quite a bit of your vision, right? Uh, while actually, while I was in Thai, in Taiwan, um, I was president of uh, the, uh, the so-called Sandy Fu Tan uh, NTU uh, Original Tribe Service Club, and a lot of these friends uh, eventually become pretty good network for for you to connect with. Um, some guys very successful in political arena, some guys very successful in business arena. Uh, and so, so these all become your, your connecting points. Uh, so, and you never know when you need, you can leverage the, uh, the connection. So again, uh, if you can participate in community service and broaden your network, um, a lot of time actually you turn out it's, it's very helpful for your career. Uh, and certainly I've been serving through um, uh, like and and but I think most probably is that we co-found the connecting TW. So the whole purpose is to to um, to link up uh, all the uh, the, the uh, I think people who want to contribute back to Taiwan. So we set up uh, uh, classes in uh, different different college uh, and so everybody can contribute uh, try to convey our experience work experience um, to uh, the, the young generation in Taiwan so we've been doing that uh, and currently we are collaborating with uh, like Zhongxin University and Dalton University uh, and by the way Dalton University classes uh, will be led by Wilson so if we also need to recruit future lecturers, uh, you can take the opportunity. So uh, I think that's a very lengthy introduction of my career. But again, I want you to take away point is while you're in, in your career, you never know what's needed, what's not needed. So if, if you're on a project, try to learn it well. And that, that, build, that thought you build up eventually will become uh, something that might be very useful to you. Uh, and then try to stay with a very, you know, keep your professional reputation uh, there. So in the future, your, your friends and your colleagues uh, spread out to different industry, different area, might think of you and give you a lot of ample opportunity. Or you want to start your own opportunity, then you have a lot of uh, resources that you can hook up to. So these are all critical points I would like you to uh, as a takeaway. Okay, now let's go 
go to uh, today's uh, main topic uh, to talk about Waha company. Um, so Waha actually is based on the innovation by our founder, uh, Professor Omar Yagi. Uh, he actually pioneered this class of material in 1995, so it's been a long while. And the, the critical, the, I, I think the innovative things about this material is, first of all, it's a microscopic uh, crystal structures. Um, so if it, it formed by the, uh, the, uh, the aluminum element and the linking elements, so you mix them together and go through some chemical process, then you can form this pretty nice uh, structure. And through the, uh, the linking uh, structure, you can tailor the bonding uh, to do hydrogen uh, bonding rich, then you can capture a lot of water, or you, you can do amine uh, bonding rich, then you can capture CO2 and so on. So this material actually can be tailored uh, by changing the uh, the anchor material and then change the linker material. So you can capture uh, water, can capture hydrogen, can capture natural gas or carbon dioxide or other species. And our company actually is founded based on this material that's specially designed to capture water. Um, so what's unique about this material? First of all, the crystal structure actually is very uniform. So we're talking about the, uh, the spacing only about six to seven angstrom. And why it's so critical is because with such a tiny filtration, all the contaminants cannot get in. It, only water can get in and water can form bonding site on the, at the interior of the crystal. Um, so that make pure water generation a lot easier. So, and that will become one of the characteristics uh, that we can package as a selling point as our material and our business uh, uh, proposition. And this material also uh, has the uh, uh, interesting uh, water uptake. It's actually pretty high. Uh, uptake about 3.33 liter per kilograms of mole CO3. So you can pick up water from, from air uh, at relative humidity. Um, I think greater than 17%, you can actually start to pick up water. So you can pick up water in a very dry environment. And and if you compare all the solvent in the marketplace, like zeolite, silica gel, as uh, sapo 39, 34, this is maturely uh, Mitsubishi material, uh, benchmark to water. More fuel uh, three desorption energy uh, penalty is only about uh, less than 10%. And all the other solvent-based material has a very high uh, latent energy that, that basically you need to supply enough energy for water to leave the material. And so it would be, like say for instance, your light would be extremely energy hungry uh, when you try to take water from air and then try to reactivate the material, then you, you require a lot of uh, energy uh, to do it. So, but just, being better by 10%, do we have a business case? I think we can talk about that <laughs> later. Um, and one of the, uh, the critical characteristics um, based on this, uh, this solvent material for metal organic framework, if you see zeolite, zeolite actually um, will pick up water when area is very dry, even 1% RH will pick up water almost fully. Uh, but the water pickup capacity is only about 0.25 gram per gram. And the trouble is, it's easy to pick up, but it's very difficult to, to release water. To use this material as a system, you have to pick up water from air, but then you have to dry it. So you can continue to, uh, to run your process uh, indefinitely. So in zero light, uh, give you a benchmark, zero light, you will probably need to spend six kilowatt hour per liter uh, in order to dry the water out. So it's a pretty high number. Uh, in benchmark water is only about 0.8 uh, kilowatt hour per liter for evaporation energy. Uh, so zero light has very special uh, application, but in a lot of major application, uh, zero light will be very difficult to do humidity regulation. And a typical linear system like the uh, 
glycerol or um, the uh, silica gel system is mostly act as a linear system. So when environment is very wet, then you can pick up water okay. Uh, but when you release water, it, it, was, it will be easy up front and then it will be tougher in the back. Um, so it's, it's not a very, uh, I say uniform performance. So, so in comparison, uh, metal organic framework has this depth function characteristics and it also has high water uptake. So what this step function uh, do for the system is this. Uh, if you look at this chart, I forgot to ex explain this chart. Uh, the vertical axis is water uptake of the material. And the, uh, the horizontal axis is the relative humidity of the material, uh, of the, where's the material sitting the environment uh, that you see. So for more material, what we can do is you can put it in room temperature at very low humidity environment, like 25%, 22%. You'll, you'll fully pick up water here. And then what you do is you raise temperature up to so say 50 degrees C, now you can dissolve. So the temperature span between desorption and absorption actually is very small for uh, this isosum step uh, metal organic framework. And this is actually it's a very critical point, which our company missed for the first two years, uh, almost caused us to went bankrupt. Uh, but then uh, right now we completely change our direction uh, about which market we try to address and which uh, performance uh, value proposition we try to propose to our customer. And now we see uh, actually pretty bright uh, futures uh, for our company and for our technology. And the other important characteristic is um, this step function actually can be tuned. Say, let's say, for instance, if you go to like UAE or go to Saudi Arabia, uh, their environment can be very dry, right? Like, like the environment can go down to like 20% relative humidity. And if you still want to pick up water from the air, then you have to choose the isosense step shifting all the way to the left. And so you can accommodate that. Uh, but if the isosum shift to the left, then what happens is uh, you, will, you will need to uh, take longer time to, to pick up water uh, for one thing. And the other thing is when you try to dissolve water, the energy uh, consumption will be on the higher side. So if your environment allowed, then you would like to pick a material that can shift to the right. So you have a you have cheaper water generation cost. So 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 we own this uh, technology uh, by licensing through uh, UC Berkeley. Um, so we can tune uh, the isosense step anywhere from uh, twelve percent, eight percent, uh, all the way to maybe forty percent. Uh, the the more you shift to the right, the more energy efficient the material is. But the more you shift to the left the more you can handle pick up water in a very dry environment. So it's really depends on what application uh, we, are, we are going after. We'll pick the right uh, metal organic framework material to address the market. And this is also the other very interesting uh, characteristic uh, of the, uh, the metal organic framework. Um, it turns out if you plot out the isotherm uh, measure against a uh, constant temperature at 15 degrees C, 25 degrees C, 30 degrees C, 35 degrees C, and so on. Uh, the shift actually is relatively minor for this step. So it's relatively easy to design a system to take advantage of this. Uh, that's energy efficient. Um, so, so later we'll, we'll share how our system actually operate um, with these characteristics. So, so based on this technology, the material technology we have on hand, so Professor Omar Yagi founded Water Harvesting Inc. in 2018. That's almost four and a half years ago. Uh, so at that time, Professor Yagi's dream is uh, to use his novel so solvent to address worldwide water crisis. And why we say that uh, is because in 2016, uh, the World Economy Forum publish a, a data to stress that in the future, uh, humanity will encounter a lot of water stress issue in a lot of regions. Um, 
and this is projected to be by 2030, actually not too far away. And desalination has its own set of issue. Uh, first of all, it's difficult to do it at the, in, in, at the inner land. And second of all, if your bay is too small, like the Persian Bay, then the salinity of the, uh, the, the salt will become an issue. So, so based on this, um, the company, uh, at that time we hired a CEO and then we hired a CTO, which was the guy who hired me. Uh, and so, so basically what we do is uh, we, we look at this problem and say, aha, we have a material that we can make water from, from air. And we, we can address a lot of uh, humanity issue like say for instance, the, the projected information is one in nine today like basic drinking water and one in two will live with water stress by 2025. Um, so, so if you take this and you think, wow, I have a golden opportunity. So, uh, so certainly there's a, a lot of issues with dwindling source, right? You have, you have groundwater over extraction, you have, Equifier depletion, you have climate change, you have contamination, you have delivery challenge and all this. So, so a lot of people is talking about distributed water generation and so on. So we we'll say, hey, okay, uh, what we have is water in air actually is major natural resources. So if you analyze how much water actually in the air, that's a lot. <laughs> so, so in theory, if you can capture water from air, uh, you should be able to address water issue for humanity for the for for the near future or for the long future. Um, I think it's a pretty good story. When I joined it, actually, I was totally convinced this is the right thing to do. Uh, so we should focus on this. Um, so in a nutshell, how we use the material to generate water. So basically, what we have is we have this metal organic framework. Uh, we blow air across the uh, metal organic framework, then you'll pick up water from air. And once it got saturated, you move it into an enclosed box, heat it up, and force the environment humidity to drop below whatever the isosome step is. And now water will be released. Uh, it's somewhat dynamic in flavor. Uh, so then you form a hot steam in this area. Then you begin to draw steam out and go through a condenser to condense water down, uh, water out. And through this way, you can really reactivate more. When you say reactivate, is from a wet state, fully saturated state, and make it dry again so you can move it out and pick up water from the air again. So in a nutshell, this is the, uh, the basic technology. And based on this technology, we do build a system uh, and been showcasing Smithsonian as a future technology and, and display there for almost nine months. Uh, and the machine was running and generating water. Um, but the, the problem is uh, then we actually are running out of cash <laughs> in our, as a startup. Uh, so basically after two years and a couple million dollars spent, there's really no revenue uh, generated product and we don't have a customer, a paying customers. We have a lot of uh, paper published. We have a lot of uh, publicity through this uh, Smithsonian stuff. Um, so since we are running short in money, so the original executive team, including the guy who hired me, our CEO and CTO were let go uh, after I joined the company for about four months. So, and then another unfortunate things hit is uh, when COVID actually hits in 2020. And so water harvesting is running short on cash. So what to do? You close the door or you continue. Uh, so I think actually I learned a lot through the process. Right? It's, it's kind of interesting eye opener for me. Um, so what we did is this, um, the chairman uh, at that time was Laura Smolia. So, she went out for executive uh, search. And then uh, in May, we hired this new CEO on board. And this CEO actually is quite experienced in running startup. Uh, she's been through a few startups. And he has pretty solid background in 
Uh, he graduated from Stanford MBA, uh, and then with uh, Berkeley uh, Legal uh, School, School of, uh, of Law, graduated, and then he went through a few startups. Uh, so what he did is, uh, let me say, hey, uh, we're running short of money, and we already spent a couple million dollars. So what would happen is existing investor will need to do a down round to give off share so we can allow for new investor to come in. So he took a lot of effort to try to uh, talk to uh, existing investor to persuade them um, that's the right thing to do. And in the meantime, actually through the, the, this time that we're running short on cash, we still have a couple of, uh, uh, say, $300,000 that we can run experiment with. Um, so what we decided to do as an engineering team is to, uh, to review what's the true uh, selling point of our material, of our technology. And then we tried to do a bench top demo, very low cost. So we build everything ourselves. Uh, so, so we'll be able to demonstrate some technology uh, in a very short time. And we use the data to persuade the, uh, the existing uh, investor that we have a new direction that can attract investor. And then we also uh, been able to find new investor to come in um, to, to really uh, inject new cash uh, into the system. Uh, so we did a lot of financial restructure and and certainly, as I told you, well, we come up with a totally different solution, uh, but using this material as, as a baseline, enable the technology and follow a few critical patterns. And this enable the new team uh, to be able to sell to uh, existing investor uh, and the future investor uh, about it's a worthwhile uh, investment. Um, so, and not only that, uh, I think our CEO uh, also uh, force the board uh, to give up a good chunk of share and recognize uh, the remaining four of us uh, to be the new founders. Uh, so that actually give a lot of motivation for the new executive team uh, to really perform. Um, so there's a lot of negotiation uh, in that front, but uh, I think it's a pretty eye-opener for me. Uh, it's, I think uh, I, I learned a lot through the process. And then in 2022, we even uh, established a new board as a new chairman. Uh, and so the all, all executive teams are all gone. The chairman is gone, uh, are gone. CEO gone, CTO gone. <laughs> so now we have a new CTO, new CEO, new chairman. Uh, and I, I become executive VP for uh, product development. Uh, so that's the, in a nutshell, that's how we turn things around and uh, been able to, um, to make a good uh, business uh, value proposition uh, so we can attract a new investor. So this is the new uh, founding team. Uh, so basically we have uh, Frank Remietz, uh, as I told you, he's a serial entrepreneur. Uh, it's important to have uh, whoever steer the ship has a lot of experience in this area. Uh, and he has, has he know he know financial stuff quite well, he know legal stuff quite well, uh, and he know the startup operation quite well. And so he hired his buddy, Chris K, as a COO, who focused a lot on business development. And Chris also has a lot of serial entrepreneur uh, experience, um, and, but he's a software background. So one thing good about these two gentlemen is uh, he fully trusts the two uh, technical guys uh, to do our work. So we have Eugene Kaplan as the CTO. He is the MOF guru. He was a Professor Yagi's uh, protege, um, and he's a MOF expert. And I have a lot of experience in Seagate from a product development point of view. And, and I also have social science heat transfer background, though I did not use it after I graduated. And it turned out to be very handy uh, uh, after 30 some years. And now it's all come back and become the enabler uh, for this company. So I'm quite glad the, uh, this thing actually, eventually the dot come back uh, to become a very shiny or splendid dot for me. Um, 
So what's, what's the difference um, between the earlier failure and this new, uh, new company direction? Um, I think in the, before they let, they let go or the CEO and CTO, they focus a lot on uh, water generation from air. And, but if you look at our technology, it's really, you have two parts. One is you pick up moisture from air and two is you generate water from the pick up moistures. Um, so, so basically you can do it as a dehumidification or you can do it as the, um, uh, the water generation uh, machine. Uh, both has its own niche market. Uh, but the underlying things is the energy requirement is still very critical. You have to beat existing technology in energy consumption. If you just have a novel, uh, the new material, novel material, and you cannot achieve the energy uh, target or energy efficiency, uh, according to a, a lot of customer feedback, it's, it's not worthwhile if you only gain 10% or 20% for them to gain uh, equipment turnover. And you will only get those information when you really talk to your customer and has a lot of serious or serious discussion and all this. So, so what's the key, key thing is, um, so since we have a new team and we have people focus on business development, so Chris K has been talking to almost one day, you can talk to five potential uh, field of application or different company to see what's the underlying uh, message that we value proposition, business proposition, we need to deliver in order to win business. Uh, it all turned out to be, yes, it's nice to be able to generate water from air. It's nice to be able to de do dehumidification from air. But if you don't have energy efficient system that can replace current system uh, with better efficiency by 2x <laughs> or a significant amount, and then there's no business. So, and, and drinking water crisis, unfortunately, is all happened to poor country and poor village. So it's very difficult to do a business that based on that. Um, so most of the advanced economy has money, but they also have infrastructure to supply drinking water. So drinking water is not an issue for them. All the issue happened in poor country, poor area. So that's why it's very difficult to formulate a business, just try to do water from there uh, as a business. So, so what we do in that period when we are all uh, short on cash and we even put on furlough for about two months. So I was on unemployment pay for two months uh, in during COVID time. And, and we still go to work every day, uh, try to demonstrate this system actually work. This is the proposed system. It's called heat pump based uh, more reactivation system. And so on paper, this one should be able to deliver performance a lot better than current solvent based uh, dehumidification system uh, in the marketplace. So we have this idea with our pattern, uh, but, but just having pattern is still difficult to get money from investors. So we, we built a few simple demonstrations to demonstrate Yes, it actually worked. Uh, so, and then investors begin to put in money and then we, we actually build the actual system based on the system. And now we can very safely say this technology actually work and we beat whatever in the marketplace uh, depends on application by at least 40% to 90% uh, of energy efficiency. So, um, so now we have a lot of the big investor looking at us, um, try to uh, do investment. And we even has a pretty big Japanese company um, to work with us, um, to come up with uh, all sort of a uh, different solution for dehumidification need for lithium ion battery factory. Uh, I'll share that in next slide. So if you, based on Chris's work, right, you talk to various industry, various area. Uh, so the, the basic market that we can address, one is dehumidification. And certainly this in iron battery factory is one critical uh, area. And that's where one of our investors is the Japanese company. They're pretty big, uh, about $40 billion company. Um, so what they want to do is they want to go into solid state uh, battery factory and, and lithium iron solid state battery 
require relative humidity down to point uh, actually 01, uh, absolute humidity down to 0 0.01 gram per cubic meter. Typically in air, even in this very dry California environment, it still has about four, five, six gram. To drive from six gram to 0 0.01 gram, actually it's, it's, it's very costly in energy consumption. So, so they, they think we can come up with a solution for them and we did come up with a solution for them uh, that actually show on paper, we should be able to save their energy costs by 40%, uh, if not more. Um, so, so they got all excited. And so right now we are in the joint development activity with them on this dehumidification application. And then uh, on dehumidification for, uh, for uh, this, uh, what's called a low dew point application, also include cold storage, where you can store medical device, you can store uh, meat. <laughs> There's all kinds of stuff, stuff require cryogenic storage, and they also require uh, humidity management. And I think our technology can also answer to that. And then there's a vertical farm, uh, the CEA. Um, they need to manage their um, internal humidity to a constant level and plant constantly generate water. So they have to constantly remove moisture. And so it turned out to be that can be a pretty uh, good potential market for us. So we sign about nine later of intent, uh, we have nine data of intent from nine different uh, vertical farms company. Uh, basically the statement is, if we deliver mach the machine to the performance we claim, then they will buy our machine. Um, and certainly if you want to look at the really big market, then we're talking about buildings, HVAC market. Uh, there's a lot of um, work in this space, uh, try to separate latent energy from uh, the sensible energy uh, to deal with HVAC. So we have more constant load on the HVAC system. Uh, so it's more energy efficient. So there's a, a lot of potential in that space. And certainly water from air is not, is not dead end. Uh, we do have older from, uh, from uh, a mid east country uh, to provide agricultural water supply uh, from a very dry area. Um, so that's actually, it's a pretty interesting niche market. And then we also get uh, one order from Exxon Mobil. They want to do, uh, in one of the dry Texas area, they want to collect water and then pump water back to the ground. <laughs> uh, don't ask me why they want to do that. <laughs> so, but anyway, they pay for one unit. So we are, we are on for, uh, deliver that. But I think the more exciting stuff for me is really this uh, pure water generation. I think it can be a good impact to humanity. Um, the, as I explained to you, our morph material is very uh, uniform, regular crystal structure, so it can capture water uh, only. Right? So and when you release water, it will be pure water, so you don't need to go through a lot of purification process and it should be a pretty low cost pure water generation. And so I've been talking to a, a pretty big company in Switzerland, uh, trying to do uh, home dialysis. Um, so they need good grade of water supply to home dialysis patient uh, for them to do dialysis every day. And this will change the life of the dialysis patient, uh, I believe. Uh, so I think that's an exciting project for me. But as for any medical uh, application, it's a long, long time to revenue and long time to a profit. So our company strategically decided to do this after we attack the lithium ion battery factory and some of the drinking water uh, solution, uh, whereas your paying customer um, show up and you do de deliver your, tailor your technology to answer to their need. So basically that's the basic uh, thinking change and value proposition change of our company. And now we've become really try to address the global uh, uh, trend to become greener and greener for decarbonation. So we can be part of the game uh, and then that can attract more investors. So we did a bit market analysis uh, Again, if you look at HVAC, dehumidification is a huge market. We're talking about 
about two hundred ninety one billion dollar company. And but I think as a small startup, uh, it's better to start from a niche market where you don't have a lot of competitors. Uh, and and it's good to have a strategic uh, customer that you can work with to fine tune your technology. Um, to make sure you you have everything designed in and, and do it right. Um, so we've been uh, analyzing this uh, market information uh, based on the feedback we talk to people. And, and we put more weight on whoever is, is paying show money up from. And this way about somebody just say, ah, it's interesting. <laughs> we potentially we can we can use it. Then when you say, where's the PO? Then they just say, ah. <laughs> That would be next stage. So they will say once you have the equipment, they will evaluate. So, uh, so that's where how we pick our target market. Um, and certainly, if we have to pick target market working very closely with our customer uh, to really analyze the current factory uh, energy utilization uh, configuration for dehumidification need or for other HVAC need. So we have to calculate the up upex capex. Uh, sustainability and all kind of concern they have. You really need to learn from your customers. And then you tailor your technology, try to satisfy as many items as, as possible. And certainly all the critical items need to be met. Otherwise you don't have a business. Um, so I think these are the critical points I learned from the business end, which I never learned from CDEC. So I think after I share all this, um, uh, personally, I really think uh, we are onto something and we should be able to provide some really neat solution for humanity uh, in different area. Uh, but we just need to make our business plan right and to do execution right. Um, so that's pretty much uh, wrap up my talk. Um, if you guys have any question, uh, I can entertain uh, a few questions. Thank you, thank you, uh, Davis. Uh, uh, awesome uh, presentation. Basically, uh, I personally learned a lot regarding the pretty much the process up and down in this uh, startup. Um, even with very solid uh, technology, doesn't guarantee you can always make money or make business working, right? You pretty much share with the community that uh, good technology doesn't mean good business, right? So you need to figure out how to get a good business using the good technology. So um, I think that's what you're trying to conclude, right? Uh, yes. uh, so we are open to the public. Uh, any Anyone want to uh, ask your questions, uh, you can pretty much just uh, turn your mic uh, to ask yourself directly. Uh, I know there's a question in the Q&A uh, window already uh, from Chi, uh, Chi, am I right? Chi Chow. Uh, would you like to you know, ask yourself? Yes, I was wondering, uh, it's, it looks to be a very fantastic system, but how do you deal with the uh, all kinds of pollutants in the air? Yeah, well, actually, I think this is a very good question. And uh, first of all, um, most of the contaminants, if we let it into our system, uh, will, will, will literally rest on the surface. And then when we drive the water out, uh, water will dominate the, the steam. And then we draw the steam back into a condenser. Uh, unless the contaminants uh, uh, co-condense with water, the water will be very pure. Um, but you can always do a, do a, a, a front filtration similar to a HEPA filter. Um, thing, if you really want to make pure water. Uh, if you don't want to make pure water, actually the, the amount of contaminants is so small that it's non-detectable. Uh, we run our system in, um, while uh, there's a fire hazard, Oregon fire hazard, <laughs> and then we collect water, send out for water uh, uh, quality test. And uh, so actually water is very pure. So, so if you look at maturity of the, uh, the so-called uh, water from air system, they use the so-called cold plate technology. So uh, in air, there's a lot of uh, uh, contaminants. And since you have to pass very high amount of uh, air through the system, you bring in human, tremendous amount of contaminants. 
uh, and co-condense with the system. And in our system, we literally break it, break it up into several things. One is we don't need a lot of air to, to do um, all this absorption, and we can also do a proper filtration. And then when we try to dissolve water out, um, and before you enter the con condensation uh, things, since there's a minute amount of uh, potential pollutants, uh, we should be able to deal with that. Uh, thank you. I have a related question. Yeah, so um, you just mentioned the, the semiconductor um, industry, right? So I know during the process, they need very pure water. Yeah. yeah. So I guess one question is, um, I know they have very high standard for the purity of the water. Mm -hmm. So can the water generated by this um, pass their standard? Well, currently, no. Uh, okay. So that's why part of the reason we don't want to address pure water market, uh, because that market, first of all, is a long qualification cycle, uh, and two, has very high standards uh, to meet requirements. And on the other hand, medical grade pure water actually is much easier as long as you provide consistent uh, water quality, uh, then it can be used for uh, in sufficient uh, purity, then you can apply for medical field. Uh, so and again, a lot of these are uh, case by case, depends on what application that we try to address. And in that sense, you really need to have your customer hold your hand to tell you, yes, you are there, no, you are not there, and how far how far away you are from the target, and what's the fundamental reason you can uh, achieve the target, that type of things. So, so I think for any startup, it's critical to have a conversation with customers, I would say. I see. And, so, and um, conversation. I see. So, current at the current stage, uh, I guess this technology in terms of water purity is not there yet, right? Oh, it's not. Well, first of all, it's, it's not our major focus right now. Okay. Right now, when we check our water purity, uh, the, the main contaminants come from the, the condenser tubing that we use. We use aluminum tubing. So it ended up with some aluminum ion uh, dissolved in the system. So if you really want to have pure water, when you condense it down, you have to make sure your water path is clean and doesn't leach anything out from the, the condenser wood. I see. So I guess in the near future, do you have any solution to that uh, water purity? Well, any this, like ideas? Well, if, I'll say short term, no, because we're not addressing the market. Okay. Uh, but there's a lot of uh, thought about how can we improve water quality to achieve the purity requirement. Uh, and certainly there's one of our investor, he's, uh, he's, he's a medical device company, he founders, he sold his company to Perkin Elmers. Um, so he putting a lot of his money <laughs> into our company. So, so he, I think he really think, um, he make a few suggestions we can do a premium inner coating uh, for condenser. He can also do quartz tubing uh, type of things. Uh, so so I, I'll say in general, if we want to attack that field, then you really, I, I would do the first thing not to spend money. The first of all is to talk to a potential customer and to see whether they will have any interest whatsoever and how much resources they're willing to put in and what kind of market uh, potential there is for such technology before you actually spend your engineering resources into it. And if, if, if as a team, you decided that's a good market to go after, now you really need to spend, raise all the questions you raise. <laughs> Okay, so so uh, what is the number one market you're targeting right now? Right now, we try to do low dew point, uh, low uh, humidity uh, management. Okay. So like lithium ion factory battery, uh, and then maybe cold storage. Uh, but the I think the first target would be try to dry humidity from 
whatever room humidity down to 0.01 gram per cubic meter. And benchmark to existing technology, we need to say at least 40% to 50% of the energy. So that's the joint project we have with one of our Japanese investors um, to work on this. I see. So uh, we have one question from the audience, from Mike. Mm -hmm. How about your uh, Waha MOF material cost to commercial use? So well, I guess- I would say more um, 303 actually is very expensive. And, but our Japanese uh, partner, they want to get into this area. So, so they actually synthesize the material for us. And they try to find a way to do cost down for synthesis. And uh, again, a lot of these new material is depends on the volume. Cost actually a lot, it's a lot depends on the volume. So uh, we do recognize that we need to do cost down if we use more 303. Um, but as I tell you, we can, I told you earlier, we can kill our more. We don't need to use that particular more. We can use other more to satisfy uh, a lot of application. So, uh, so some more actually is 10x uh, cheaper than this more. For example, the aluminum fumarate by BASF is a lot cheaper, maybe he, two order of magnitude cheaper than, um, than this uh, MOF 303. And it has good water uptake, but it's ISO SIM step is about 24% rather than MOF 303 is at 12%. So for very dry application, that's not a suitable material. And the MOF 303, the key thing is, since it's applied to factory and factory can take uh, be high, can absorb a bit higher cost uh, from equipment uh, pricing point of view. So, um, so that's where uh, starting with equipment is, is a good choice. I see. Okay, so I actually have a related question. So I would imagine uh, like for long distance uh, ship, like over the sea, right? When yeah. you're over the sea, drinking water can be a major issue. Right, so, um, like, I, I would imagine if uh, no one is using this technology yet uh, on ship, it's because it's too expensive. Yeah, but I do consider that uh, over the sea you have good uh, relative humid humidity, right? Yeah. So, so uh, if you want to apply this uh, for like long distance ship, what's yeah. the the difficulty there? And then, um, like for the cost. It's uh ten times more expensive or even more. Like what's the the well, I'll how say far? Probably not. Uh, and I think you have a very good suggestion about with uh, one additional market that we potentially can take. Um. So if we try to do it on the ship, we probably you can do a few things, right? Uh, because we we have a heat pump based system, we just need electricity to drive the system. Um. And it also depends on how much water you need to generate uh, out of the system, right? And uh, a lot of people is trying to couple into solar energy, a solar panel uh, to drive the unit. Um, so there's many possibilities. So, so basically, but drinking, but in ocean, I tend to think desalination probably will be a cheaper solution. So yeah, that's what I would guess. So I, I, I would like to know like, uh, what's the gap there? Maybe well, this technology the is like uh, how, like it, very far away, or it's very close. Well, desalination is probably ten times cheaper than what I we see. do with our with our technology. I see. So it's it's probably for us to compete with that. We are committing suicide. <laughs> <laughs> so we better compete in a in a place that uh, desalination will be difficult. Um, and there's a lot of area that actually has that. <laughs> I see. Okay, so actually I have one more question, but that's not uh, a technical question. It's more uh, related to the, the career, but I will uh, keep it to, to later. So anyone has any questions from, uh, from our audience right now? Okay. Yeah, so, so if not, then maybe... <laughs> 
I'll just ask, ask one more question. So you mentioned that um, this company was actually in a very uh, dangerous place and you have like two weeks furlough, right? Two months. <laughs> two months, okay. So um, during this two months furlough, do you think of uh, like uh, abandoning the ship and um, like any way out or you're just thinking um, I, I, I'm going to make something happen? Well, I, I, actually, I'm in a slightly different position. So uh, actually, the reason during photo, I still come to work every day because I do think we, with this material, we can create something uh, good for humanity. Um, so to me, it's just, uh, just as uh, Steve Jobs said, you want to stay hungry, stay foolish. <laughs> so I just stay foolish and you, you, you work on things based on your own conviction and nobody asks you to do anything. And I just think uh, I can construct a heat pump system uh, to demonstrate we can achieve low energy reactiv reactivation and by burn balancing the desorption energy and the condensation temp uh, energy. Uh, so doing follow is just keep building that. And while the new new executive keep looking for money. <laughs> and we believe, personally, I always believe um, if you have a good idea and you have a good business proposition, you will find money, right? And a lot of people will tell you, oh, to get money, you have to go to prepare a pitch, five minutes, five minutes pitch or, or elevator pitch, all this. Uh, I would say my experience, no, you don't need to do those. Uh, all you need to do is once you have some data on hand, you have some good story on hand for value business value proposition, you call this guy and the investor is everywhere. Uh, and it's come from different angles, different place. We, we, we found a fund just focused on investing on water space. And we found a fund who's focused on HVAC space. Um, and this particular fund, OGCI, they, they are 10 uh, energy company joined force together. Uh, they put together $1.1 billion for investing. Um, so we were talking to them, they got excited, they want to invest. So, uh, and uh, we also met with the um, Larry Page's brother, Carl Page, and he also got excited about technology and want to invest. Um, so, so I think it's it's all about, and then through the interaction, it's not two it's not two minutes elevator pitch. We literally prepare. Certainly, you want to be concise. Within thirty minutes, you can explain what's your technology, what your technology can do for the society, and then you demonstrate the actual data, the actual equipment you build, and then they'll be convinced. Um, so, so I I think you know. Uh, I don't know whether any of you have been through a startup training program. Uh, they will train you on a lot of about uh, being a two minutes elevator pitch. I'll say that's only a starting point and that's really happened. You already, you have a real chance that you bump into something, somebody significant on elevator then you have to give two minutes pitch. <laughs> Most of the time you seek that person out and show them you have a case. When you were in follow, was your family supporting you? Oh, they didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so just still go to work every day and uh, pretend nothing happens. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I see. <laughs> so uh, again, this, this is actually just pretty much based on my own conviction. I think uh, this material is very interesting. It's very innovative. And we should be able to take advantage of the material to create a business case. So that has been my conviction. So I always told my, my CEO, say, if you don't have money, you don't need to pay me. I continue to work. So unless uh, one day I'm running out of conviction, then uh, <laughs> it's time to walk away. So um, I, I think, Ximing, you still have a correct question to ask, right? Uh, no, I think uh, I asked all my questions. 
So then I have a, also have a career question for David. Um, what make you decide to leave uh, such a successful public com public trading company, CK, and decide to join a startup? Um, <clears throat> the reason I'm asking is because our community is very interested in uh, in your personal decision. Of, of course, I'm talking about from career development point of view. That that's the only uh, aspect we want you to share, uh, because usually people decide to move from successful company to the small startup, right? You need to jump from very stable life to a very high risk life, right? Uh, financially, and also um, the minute, uh, the leadership wise, pretty much you will uh, start from the uh, high level leadership to pretty much individual contributor, so. Um, community members really want you to share from leadership point of view or from personal career development point of view, why you make this decision. And second question is why this industry? Because it's not related to your hard drive experience. Um, well, I'll say uh, have luck, have, uh, have um, your own decision, your own choice. So, um, I think from very early on, when I joined Seagate, we've been constantly looking for what technology will be the leading technology within the company. <laughs> so you try to transform yourself into that position. Um, so in probably the, the the number eight years or number nine years, I remember is probably 1995. And I would think personally, Personally, my analysis of CK situation is this: the the leading person or most technology leading person will most likely come from magnetic material deposition side, and I'm not. I'm on the mechanical side. So, so I I really see well if I want to stay CK and climb up, I better find a project that uh, I can lead eventually become the core technology of CK. So, so I was betting on big pattern media as the uh, the next generation technology that will happen. Uh, so, I eventually managed to lead the big pattern media team in Seagate. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, the corporate decision is they decided to go with uh, heat assisted magnetic recording technology as our next generation technology. So we begin to see our project get less and less significant within the company. And that caused a lot of um, headache for me. Uh, one is how do you protect your team? How do you protect your project? How do you continue to persuade people? Uh, is there a critical project to go? Right. Um, so that, that become a very tough environment for me with that project. And then the other issue I have is uh, I was assigned to product uh, team. So I both <laughs> I work on big pattern media and then I work on product qualification. Uh, and and try to build some credit so I can protect my team. I was thinking that way. Um, so we have some very successful uh, product qualification. So uh, for product design for mobile drive. So that was in uh, probably two o five uh, or two o fifteen range. Um, we actually Seagate successfully developed a mobile drive, uh, one terabyte per platter. And we all, we actually participate in the design, and with that work, we're very proud of it. But after that, that's the last mobile drive of hard drive, so I lost my platform. So I so I don't have a a product design to work on. I don't have a, a big pattern media that that can persuade company to continue to invest. So that call, that put me in a very awkward position, I'll say. Right, so. So, and then, then I've, I've been struggling, struggling, and then try to look for a way out for the Bipeda Media Group, where we have a lot of nice nanotechnology. So we persuade our VP to do bio device using nanotechnology. That's where we spent a good solid two years uh, doing some DNA sequencer. Uh, so learn a lot about DNA sequencing and all this, but it ended up CK, it's a boom bust cycle. When it's done, all these uh, not immediately money making project will get will get trimmed. 
So we, uh, again, eventually we lost our platform. But the funny part is when we are working on DNA sequencer, the biotech device, we got to collaborate with a startup um, which later hired me into Waha. Their CTO is Bruno Marchand, who was my manager <laughs> in Sega in the early day. Uh, so, so basically those are the, the kind of connection that you build through your, through your initiative or your project. So eventually we, we got to a point, I think, where there's really no feature for me in CK. So, so then I made up my mind, I want to, uh, I want to leave CK and, but then I don't know what, what to do. So, but then fortune smiled upon me. Uh, what happened is uh, one of the colleagues, uh, not colleagues, uh, friends in CTW connecting to Taiwan, Zhen uh, Xiaohui, uh, she, she came from Taiwan to visit me in, uh, in Bay Area. Uh, so we had lunch together and she told me she is interested in venture capital field. She wants to uh, join that field. And, uh, and suddenly it dawned on me. When I work on bio device project, I I talked to our Waha chairman Laura Smalley at that time. I didn't know he was she was Waha chairman uh, at that time. So we talked to her and say, "Hey, this lady would like to get into venture fund, and you run venture fund. <laughs> Could you mentor her?" Uh, and then in the email, I also send a note say, "I decided to leave Seagate. So the next day, she called me back say. Under their portfolio company, uh, they are doing water from air technology, and then Bruno Marchand was CTO. He needs somebody with heat transfer background. So I say, okay, I have heat transfer background. So <laughs> <laughs> I wow. talked to Bruno since we already know each other, so it's an easy, easy case for him to apply. But, but unfortunately, he got let go after I joined the company for four months. <laughs> I see. Oh, wow. So <clears throat> what a journey. Uh, thanks for sharing the detail why you decide to uh, leave CK and join this uh, startup company. So I guess uh, you don't need to answer why this industry because you just join a startup who need your background, right? And so your background match what they need. So then you decide. And, and, and the other thing is your opportunity cost. Right? In CK, I don't see future. I don't know what, what position I'm going to play, what contribution I'm going to make and what impact I have on humanity, I cannot see anything. And with this new material, at least I know I can get water from air, I might be able to help poor people uh, have drinking water as a solution. Uh, and it's just at that time, I did, it didn't dawn on me that it doesn't have a business case. It's a very good uh, humanity case, but it doesn't have a very good business case based on what they, what they are shooting for. And I learned all this uh, through the years. And the art, Good consolation is, uh, again, we'll go back to Steve Jobs saying connecting dots. I've been building dots in my PhD years. I do heat and mass transfer uh, in, my, in my college year, in my graduate master and PhD. After graduation, I never use it for 30 some years. It's good to be able to pick up that as an ex specialty and then work on it, work on a solution. Yes. Yes, uh, such amazing though. Uh, you know, you still remember what you learned thirty years ago? Wow! I still have the book. I still have the textbook. <laughs> <laughs> I hope many people who didn't sell their book after they graduate undergrad. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, I would like to uh, uh, help other people to ask the questions. I think many people have the this question in mind. So, David, assume you are not David, right? I I want you to take other people's shoes other uh, Asian engineering in barrier shoes, okay? If they have financial concern, not financial free, in such economy downtime, would you still encourage those people to, uh, to jump to the startup they feel very exciting or staying where you are, but no future hope? Well, as, again, I cannot answer to everybody because each one has their own risk profile and, and, and risk. Uh, but I would say most people I saw, um, like um, some of my friends, 
they leave CK early to join startups and startup keep building on them. So they keep moving, but eventually they hit something that's successful. And, and one thing you also have to bear in mind is if you're in a big company in a, in a small uh, straight jacket, so the, your network actually is very limited. You only know people very similar to you and you only know people surrounding you. Uh, so it's difficult to open up opportunity uh, from this uh, very uh, tidy, uh, similar uh, background of people. So, uh, in, and if you join a startup, uh, the advantage of joining an early stage startup is you got to observe how high resources people invest. Let's say, for example, Carl Page, right? he's, he's high resources, his brother is Larry Page. So by interacting with him, he's, he's very down to earth. And it's not very elegant, not everything, so we can easily discuss, but you can see he has passion. You want to do something for humanity, but you want to do something. And then he thinks do something for humanity is best go through investment in through startup. That that's that's his view. So if you join a startup, you can impress people with high connection and high resources. Then even if one down, the other one will be up. Um so the risk really is not as high as you might imagine. Uh, but it certainly will encourage if you have a double income. <laughs> wife, has, wife is making money, then it's a lot more conservation. Right? If you only have single income, then, then sometimes I wouldn't encourage you to, to take on risk because you do have a little bit boom bust and you have yeah. enough cash to sustain you through I don't know, six months, eight months. Uh, so... Yeah, so um, you, you just mentioned the keywords, early stage startup, right? So for example, how about not early stage uh, startup, a uh, uh, hundred people startup? Well, I say the, the people you network with will be different um, when company reach certain size, right? And then you're hiring as what? Uh, it's, it's also, um, it's, it will, your position will determine will, who, which network you you become? Right, 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 right. Yeah. So, you... so like currently I'm in an early stage startup, so we got to talk to investors directly. If you are in a hundred people company, join that company, you will never be able to talk to investors. Right, right, right. Because you're in a very high position, so right. we don't know how they how they think, how they act, how they make their investment decision. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's lower risk for hundred people startup than the. Uh, five people start up, but the, right. uh, the trade-off is you have a less visibility to the real connection network of outside people and to grow more, right? Yes. So, so different people need to consider differently. So actually David just uh, shared his analysis about uh, how to decide to join which kind of a startup, why to jump from the big company to the startup, right? So so I think the community really appreciate your, your uh your, your sharing regarding the startup experience. And uh, we want to know that if we have such honor to uh, invite you to give us more uh, leadership training uh, in the future, if you have t uh, time, um, because that will be the closed loop. Uh, yeah. We would like to- Yeah, I, I, I personally don't like uh, to use training. Uh, I, I'm very happy to share my experience, <laughs> uh, share my view uh, with whoever is interested in uh, in discussion, in sure. learning together. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I'm a firm believer you can learn from each other quite a bit. No, right, right. In your own, so. Yeah, because so uh, for me, I'm particularly interested in uh, from very early career, you, uh, career, you say you joined uh, Seagate as a junior engineer, right? Yeah. And all the way up to uh, to very high level management. The senior director. Very high. So I <laughs> Okay, but eventually uh, you are VP now, right? So I, I'm kind of uh, interested in um, your growth from a junior engineer to all the way to, to VP. I, I'm very interested in that. Yeah, uh, sorry to interrupt you guys because uh, we have a time limit right now. So Shiming, uh, if you really like to learn this uh, leadership questions, 
Uh, we can invite David back next time when it's available. Is it okay for you, David? Because uh, I don't want uh, to hurry to answer in 30 seconds, right? Yeah, yeah. That's a very difficult question to answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, Shimi, is okay. We will, we, we're going to contact David in the future and yep. invite him back for the leadership uh, uh, lecture. I'm yep. not yep. kidding. Right. That, I think that's a very good topic. Um, yep. We will keep connecting uh, with uh, David, okay? So, David, I hope we have this honor to invite you back. Yeah. yeah. No problem. Thank you. We, are, we are we are good friends, anyways. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank everybody uh, to join uh, this uh, event today uh, for technical series. Uh, David give a very uh, nice introduction for his uh, startup uh, company's uh, core technology and what's its application. I hope his sharing really help um, this community. Even though you don't have such background like me, but at least you learn the basic that oh, there's a material which can um, the create uh, generate the water uh, from the air, right? So th that's a very promising knowledge uh, for us to learn. Thank you very much, and um, hope to see you again, David. And thank you everyone to join. So I think time is up. Um, hope to see you guys uh, next time in our next technical series. And please okay. keep uh, watching, uh, reading our newsletter to learn the next event. Thank you. Best luck, David. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye.